All right, this is another one of these old poems that somebody said they wanted to reprint. And this is called Akhmatova. Anna Akhmatova was a Russian poet. And uh, she lived during the Soviet era. Her whole family died in the Gulag. Um, she managed to write poems. That also mentions an artist named Modigliani, who um, was an Italian artist, and he did nudes, you know, thousands of nudes, kind of semi-abstract, and he did a nude of her, so that comes into the poem. Okay, Akhmatova, and starts off with a quote by one of, from one of her poems. Akhmatova, when I wait at night for her to come, life, it seems, hangs by a strand. Anna Akhmatova, the muse. Her marriage is unhappy, Government condemning her and calling her a whore, banning her books, consumed by whole days spent standing in, ration, standing in ration lines or at the door of a party office where she would implore release for friends and family sent away to gulag prison camps. They would ignore the pleading she would come with day by day. They did not like her poems or the nude sketches Modigliani made of her. They burned her books. She scraped for love and food. Whatever wrath her poetry incurred, she stood against the boorish, asinine, dim bureaucrats who towed the party line. They died. Their empire fell. Her poems remain. Sketches of naked truth and art's disdain for any system of bureaucracy that would restrict a poem or nudity. Shelved in my shrinking library, a hand-sized Shropshire lad, inscribed by one I loved, reminds me I was once one in twenty, houseman style. He had hitched to Tierra del Fuego, caught a freighter to Scandinavia, roamed the world ragged and open-eyed, cut his own hair, looking like young Abe Lincoln before beard. Shivering one January, we ventured in howling wind to dance on the jagged shore ice, breathless and laughing. He claimed when he reached the age he must be today, he'd hike around frozen lakes midwinter until, like the Inuit, he welcomed the cozy arms of death. When I claimed he broke my heart, he shrugged declared himself drafted as a tool of my self-destruction. Cook, as we called you then, can you hear me from your ice flow? I am, in spite of myself, mostly mended. This one's called living paycheck to paycheck. Don't make sense. All right. <clears throat> living paycheck to paycheck don't make sense. We need at least an increase in payments so we don't gotta sleep on the street pavement wrapped up in a blanket. I'd rather be rocking on stages than watching the clock while I rot at this minimum wage shift. It ain't about being famous. It's about placing food on a plate on a regular basis. And I'm losing my patience. That's my fuel, my desire, my fire inside. My mind when I rhyme is like burning rubber on tires but lines. Some don't know where I'm coming from cause they never been there. The slums with the lack of funds listening to drums to get square. Their wits get scared, that's why they stand with that slick stare. But shit don't flip fair, it only gets tougher. Watching my back while watching out for my brothers. Plus the others, the sun don't shine in the summer. Mostly clouds of rain coming down with the thunder. They trying to take me under, that's my pain. Yesterday was great, but will today be the same? You ain't guaranteed shit in this game. Having trouble, struggle, changing gears while steer to stay sane. Look in the mirror and it's strange how the years bring in change. One day you're great, then the next your career ain't the same. Yeah. <laughs> when I die on that day, what will they say? Will they say I displayed loyalty, that I treated my parents like royalty? Will they say I stood in unity with my community? Will they speak of my philosophy, my generosity, my charity, or are my good deeds a rarity? How do I spend my time, my money? Do I clothe the naked, feed the hungry, 
set captives free, or do I just feed me? Can anyone foresee his or her own eulogy? Will I be ready? Will I leave a legacy? Will my life rhyme like poetry? Will they say I spoke well of everybody? Will have, <laughs> I can't read. Will I have made it easy for anyone? I'm sorry. Will, that, will, I, will they say I spoke well of everybody? Will I, have, will I have made it easy for anybody to speak well of me? I think that's it. Because Andy's here, I should probably do one of my rhyming poems. Right. <laughs> now, this is called Spring River Run. We've got a January thaw, it's close enough. <laughs> With the fast melting snow and the hard recent rain, the wild river is high and tricky again. It's our hope that with skill we won't badly upend and trap tangled broke boughs and wait at each bend. I had told my dear children when they were small folk, when you paddle, don't bang the canoe with your stroke, but dig in like a Iroquois steady and sure, then you'll glide like an arrow, both swift and secure. My son rise in the bow and we're shooting ahead towards the great tree splayed out across the whole riverbed. The large twisted tree trunk leaves two arcs broad and small where damp waters plunge through in a chance waterfall. I glimpse logs through an arc, hear a menacing sound. We'll go left, I cry out. Steer, then yell to lie down. As we lie on our backs, there's the risk I've misread. But we're good for the trunk rushes by overhead. Though the gap is quite small, we still make the far side in a fall that we take in an effortless glide. I'm quite pleased our canoe rides the rapid descent, barely scraping the tree as on downwards we're sent. We sit up and just miss a large snag that's a fright, a mean trap that laid past the broad arc on our right. We chose well, so we smack our sure paddles on high while the birds sing our song in a victory cry. What's more, a little background, Eddie Lang, I play the guitar. He was a jazz guitar player from the 20s, and uh, got a little bit about him. And the thing this poem notes is, back then, Eddie Lang played a lot of blues. He was a white player. And he did an album with um, Lonnie Johnson, not Robert Johnson, Lonnie Johnson, who was the king of blues at that time and who was black. And uh, because of segregation, they wouldn't let him put the album out unless he changed his identity. Eddie Lang changed his identity, so he said he was Blind Willie Dunn, okay? <laughs> and, and, but, but actually it was Lang and, Lang and uh, Johnson. So this is called The Transformation of Eddie Lang. Eddie Lang played jazz on one of those great big guitars, New York style with a huge machine head and large golden tuning keys, wide neck, thick strings, but he could make himself heard in an orchestra could play as loud as a banjo, back, and because of him, banjos, ubiquitous back then, would disappear from orchestras, fade out, and the guitar replace it as the standard. Lang played for Joe Venuti and with Bix, uh, Bix uh, Biederdeck. He backed up Bing Crosby and played in the band that first recorded Georgia On My Mind. He traded riffs with Bix in that session, the first time the guitar matched up with brass and showed what it could do. His name was known except on those occasions when he did recordings with the governor of blues with Lonnie Johnson, and Johnson was black. Then Eddie Lang became Blind Willie Dunn. He donned a stereotype and a disguise, not willingly, a pseudonym in those sad times. His race was hidden, muted mask. He was not Willie Dunn, nor was he blind, except to color lines and bigotry. This is yet a different style. It's called, I told him, look everywhere. A bachelor hermit, my late uncle had lived alone at what had been my grandparents' centennial home. My son and I opened the door to find a horde of decades choking the house. 
clothes overgrew furniture. Newspaper rose from the floor like the stalagmites, and narrow walk waves through the, uh, wove through the heaps and piles. We unearthed the barrels, releasing spirits both real and imagined, and we reclaimed lost treasures. A brash chrome revolver rested under a thin blanket. A rare bottle of bourbon lay hid on a back shelf in the long, narrow kitchen pantry. Pink depression glass glowed again when raised to the light, while a crystal radio searched for broadcasts from long ago. In the basement sat coal in an old coal bucket, a can of DDT, and a hand grenade from World War II, left unattended, left there still. In the attic, were glass-blown Christmas ornaments from Germany and my grandparents' crossing trunk. Inside the trunk were my grandparents' passports from the empire of Austria-Hungary. There, too, was the original deed to my grandparents' home, newly purchased by them for $4,000 in gold. On the kitchen table was a mound of open mail, rising like the ruins of successive civilizations. As I dug down through the, the, the tell of papers, I went back through time on a surreal journey, disconcerting yet distant, until, that is, I came upon a picture of my brother and I when I was only three. Related as I am, could this be my fate? To be a mound builder? To tread worn tracks between the decades of my discards of my life? I shuddered and swore an oath not to go down that path. Then I returned to the search, for there was, of course, no money. Since banks weren't safe, cash was hid throughout the house in both odd and familiar place. Bills were stuffed in the pockets of old suits, not worn in many years. Bills were folded into a Band-Aid tin, then the tin was hid in laundry detergent. Bills were shoved into plastic bread bags, then the bags were tucked into newspaper stacks. Bills were taped under a kitchen chair. I told my son, look everywhere. <laughs> In what do you want to be paid? For what you do, what rate will you negotiate? What's it to you? What's your currency? Do you want to be on TV? Do you want cold cash? Do you want immortality? If your words and your pick could fly around the world and more, is that what you live for? Do you want to be paid in love? Is that what you dream of? Or sex the next best? <laughs> is it fame if we raise your name in words of praise that all speak? Or if you knew inside of you that you were not weak, that you were tough, that you'd do the right thing, would your heart sing? Would it be enough? <laughs>